Hey guys, I want to welcome you to our Monday night live stream. Before we go to the stream, can you like and subscribe to the channel? It helps us get the message of Jesus to our whole generation. And before we go, check this out. All the worship that you see on Monday nights, our messages, and even courses, you can find all of it at CircleRiders.tv. If you've not made a free account, make sure you click the link in the description and go check out CircleRiders.tv. All right, guys, enjoy the stream. Solar eclipse today? Our whole office was like, where is it? And it was just looked like regular sun. <laughs> And then my friend was like, we don't get to see it over here. It's only in Texas. And I'm like, that sucks for us. But yes, let's get into the, let's get into the zone, guys. We're going to worship Jesus. My name is Moda. This is our weekly Monday night worship bonanza, whatever you want to call it, as circuit riders. If you don't know us, we are a missions organization based right here. And we see God do amazing things through our generation, through the gospel. And whenever we get to come here for Monday night, it's always incredible seeing how the Lord just each and every Monday night. As we step into the presence tonight, there's our anxieties, our problems, and just we just fix our eyes on you. You're the reason why we're in this room, Jesus. You deserve all the glory, all the honor, all the praise and thanksgiving, Jesus. We give it to you tonight, and we ask that you would meet us with your presence. We ask that you would meet us with your spirit tonight. We, wanna, we want you to come close. And so, Lord, we just can we all pray out in our own words and just place a demand on God's presence? I'm going to borrow all of your faith. Can you open your mouth and just ask God to come? Ask him to come in a room with, this, with his presence. Jesus, we love you. We place a demand on your presence tonight. We say that we need you. We need you. We need you. And you are the one that we desire. You're the one that we look to. And we just ask God that you would come and crash into these these walls tonight and, in, and encounter us with your love. In Jesus' name. What's up, guys? Welcome to Monday Nights. Glad you guys are back. Come on, give a good shout of praise for Jesus tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We honor you. Come on, put your hands up. Sing it with me. Let every day that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let every day that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise you. I'll praise you on the mountain. I'll praise you when I'm so. Praise you when I'm tired.
cause you're faithful Praise cause you're true Praise cause there's nobody greater Come on, you say I praise cause you I praise cause you Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave I praise cause you I praise cause you're true
too long we've been quiet Silenced by the lies of the enemy But a new song is arising From our mouths we'll sing out a new melody Oh
because I'd love to pray with each other real quick. So guys with guys, girls with girls, just your neighbor. And what I would love for us to pray for is I would love for us to pray that God would make us more aware of his presence tonight. I feel a weighty shift in the message. We're going to sing one more song, but I feel like there's a sense of unity that needs to happen in the church tonight. So just with someone around you, just for a couple seconds, just pray that the Lord will show us his glory tonight and give us a revelation in his face. So come on, just for a couple seconds, let's just begin to pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just show us your face, God, today. We want to see your face today, Jesus. Forget the music, forget the message, forget the words, God, we want to see you, Jesus. Just pray, God, that you would make us more aware of your presence in this place. We honor you, Holy Spirit. We honor you, Father. We honor you, Son. We praise your name, in Jesus' name. Across the room, just begin to lift up your worship tonight. Begin to exalt his name. Exalt his name today. In harmony, perfect unity. Come lift your voice to the King of Kings today. Lift up your worship. Give him your praise.
God who lives above all things and reigns above all things. God, we give you glory tonight and we join with the song and declaration of heaven that you are holy and we will sing of it all the days of our lives. God, we ask that you will pour out a revelation of your kingship, pour out a revelation of your worthiness into our hearts and into our lives that we may worship you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, 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 guys. You can head to your seats. Wow. Thank you, Lord. That was such a special time of worship. <sighs> Shout out to the band, Circa Rada Music. <laughs> guys, my name is Moda. Welcome to Monday night. Last week, we were actually in Los Angeles. We did a week-long outreach in evangelism exploit of seeing so many people saved in Los Angeles, reaching our generation with the gospel. And it's so nice to be back because the drive was kind of hard, but we loved it. How many of you guys saw the eclipse today and also thought that it was the rapture? <laughs> I kept seeing that all across social media. I'm like, wait, how do these two things go together? I don't understand. Um, anyway, I'm happy to be here. I have some announcements for you, so I'm going to ask you to lean in. I got some, a lot of fun things to share with you. If you know us well, you know that we are passionate, Circuit Riders are passionate about training leaders as evangelists, as messengers, as leaders to reach this generation with the message of Jesus. And every summer, all, every summer students from all across literally the world come to our summer C CR school in the summer to get trained. Um, as evangelists and as leaders to this generation. And we are actually having an interest night on Wednesday, April 10th. So if you have any interest in being launched into your calling in a greater way, discovering your voice and the message of the gospel in and through your lives, I want you, I want to encourage you to pull out your phone to scan this QR code. You're not making a commitment, don't worry. It's just an interest night. So if you have the slightest bit of interest, this is your moment to grab more information about making a summer plan to join us for CR School. It's actually going to be here in Orange County, the, the CR School. is in Orange County July 10th to 18th, I believe. But lots more details to come on the interest night. Do I have any high schoolers in a building at all? I know every Monday night I see like loads of high schoolers. What's up? I see y'all up there. Um, I see loads of high schoolers coming from like an hour away. I can't remember the name of the city, but we love when you guys come with us to, um, to worship. But CR School is for like 17 and up. So we have something special just for the high schoolers. It's called Riders Youth Camp. We actually have two locations, one in Dallas, Texas from July 5th to 11th, and then as well in Kona, Hawaii from July 22nd to August 1st which is the day before my birthday, so that's fun. Um, but high schoolers, you guys are not, you don't have to wait to be a leader. You don't have to wait to walk out in your evangelistic call. The Lord wants you to get trained right now as a teenager to reach your high school with the message of Jesus. So if you're interested, you can also scan that QR code and get all the information that you need to have the time of your life. I mean, think about going to Kona. That's basically a vacation. I would go, but I'm not 17. <laughs> Okay, I think the last, the last ladies, 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 ladies. Do I have any ladies in the building? Oh, no, 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 no. Do I have any ladies in the building? Okay, that sounds more like it. Okay, ladies, we have a Brave Love Global Conference. That's right, emphasis on global, because women from all across the world are coming here to Los Angeles, California on June 21st and 22nd, which is our conference date. It's a two-day event. And we're actually, if you've been coming to Monday nights, you've been hearing us making announcements about it. And the, in a nutshell, the conference is for, is for women. I, I mentioned that part. But we want to give you a vision for your life as a, as a leader and as a voice to this generation. There's so many opinions and narratives out there of what it looks like for a woman to lead, what it looks like for a woman to be empowered. And we just so believe God has an opinion about it and it's biblical. So if you've ever had any hesitation of like, man, can I leave? We actually have a um, theologian coming out from Asbury Seminary. I can't remember this school, but he's legit. 
He studied over a decade women in the Bible and women and the, the call for women to lead. And so he's going to be there. Lisa Bevere is going to be, be there. Abby Gamboa, Yasmin Pierce, Christy Brandt. I mean, the names are literally incredible. There's so much to pull from from these women who are actually living out the message of the gospel in a way that's changing lives. And the Lord is inviting you into that same type of lifestyle. So if you have a desire to discover your call, your, um, your missional voice, we have a giveaway for you. So obviously come to the conference, but tonight we're doing a giveaway that I want you to enter. We're going to be announcing the winner on Friday, but there's five simple steps. The first step is that you would follow Brave Love Women on Instagram. It's spelled just how it sounds, Brave Love Women. And then number two, you would like the post. It's the, it's, it's the most recent post. You'll see it there. Um, and then tag three friends in the comments. Number four, share the post to your stories and tag Brave Love and then fill out the form giveaway that you will find in the link in bio. And this, this giveaway is not just a one ticket, but we're actually giving out four tickets so that you and all your girlfriends can come. So any ladies are like girls, girls, got their besties. I'm totally like a girl gang girl and I'm coming with my girl gang. So if you want to win a, you want to enter for a chance to win four tickets to the Brave Love Conference, follow those instructions, enter the giveaway, and it just might be your lucky day. And then if you have any, any questions about the conference, we actually have a, a booth back there in the corner where the doors are. We have some friends that would love to answer any of your questions and tell you more about it. But that's all I have. I'm going to invite Zach Nash up. Guys, we wrapped up. Yeah, you can clap for Zach. We just wrapped up an amazing series in the book of Acts, and we're actually entering into a new series tonight that Zach is going to tell us all about. Thank you, Moda. What's up? Monday night. You guys doing good? You having a good day? All right. Let me get set up here real quick. All right, you ready? So fun. Um, it's great to be back in Orange County. We weren't here last week, we were in LA. It was amazing. Special time together. So fun this morning, some of our staff, we were, uh, had our little Monday morning meeting and uh, we were sharing stories of just what happened last week in LA and some of our team was sharing testimonies of, I don't know, we had maybe 10 or 15 of our staff ministering in a prison this last week people getting born again, getting trained in the gospel, getting prophetic prayer. I mean, it's just like, it's insane. We have teams in the Philippines, in South Africa, all over the world right now sharing the gospel. And it's so encouraging that God's on the move. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that we live in a day and an age when the Lord has not stopped moving? He's actually moving. Isn't, I mean, anyone else encouraged by that, that God is saving people all over the globe? And that the gospel still works. Praise God. All right, we're jumping into a new series. And um, we're going to be going through the book of Philippians. So if you want to turn to Philippians, I highly encourage you to. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be encouraging. We're going to hit, we're going to read uh, through verse 1 through 11 in chapter 1. And then I'm going to make some comments, say a few things. And I think the Lord's going to encourage us tonight. So if we can get, can we get those uh, verses on the screen? Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Can we stand as we read the word together, if you don't mind? We got to stand for the reading of the scriptures tonight. Does anybody love the Bible in, this ha in the house tonight? So grateful. So Philippians 1, verses 1 through 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus... To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. 
It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Father, tonight we are so grateful for your word, and we ask that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would awaken us, you would illuminate your word to us by your spirit, and that we would be marked with truth. Lord, that in any way we have resisted your voice, we have we have built walls up. I ask that tonight your word would break through every wall, that you would pierce us deep within with the truth of your word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Amen. Amen. You can be seated tonight. We're going to make a few observations, and um, I believe the Lord is going to encourage us tonight. This, this book, this letter, uh, obviously written by Paul to the church and the saints at Philippi, Paul has a different tone in this letter. As you, as you heard as we were reading, there's a, there's a real tender tone that he has as he's writing this. I love the message version translation, kind of says it this way. He says, every time you cross my mind, I break out in exclamations of thanks to God. Each exclamation is a trigger to prayer. I find myself praying for you with a glad heart. I am so pleased that you have continued on in this, in this with us. Sometimes I think I feel as strongly about you as Christ does. That's the tone of this letter. It's a little bit different if you were to put it next to maybe Galatians. And here's, here's some of the things Paul says in Galatians. This is from the message translation. He says, I can't believe your fickleness. How easily you have turned traitor to him who called you by the grace of Christ, by embracing a variant message. You crazy Galatians, did someone put a hex on you? Have you lost your senses? That's his tone to the Galatians, but to the church at Philippi, I yearn for you. We don't use that word yearn very often. Maybe you do, maybe it's in your vocabulary, but it's... It's this strong, inner, deep desire. He's saying, I've tapped into the very desires of Christ for you. That's the tone of this letter. So as we read through this over the coming weeks, you're going to find this warm, heartfelt tone of Paul as he writes this letter. And in Galatians, he says nice things. He loves the Galatian church. But out of the gate, this letter has an amazing and encouraging shepherd's tone to it. Paul didn't disconnect his shepherding from his leadership. There was a, a genuine love in his heart for people, and it shines through in this letter. He yearned for them. As we continue to read through the book, you're gonna, we're going to find that joy is a major theme of this book. Who's thankful for joy in the house tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you aren't happy. You will get it tonight, I promise you. You'll smile before the night's over. But joy is mentioned, or rejoice, or joy, it's mentioned 16 times in these, you know, however your Bible's printed in these three, four pages. Joy is on every page. Rejoicing is on every page. And what's amazing is that we've, we read there that he, Paul talks about his imprisonment. Did you catch that? That Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison. I don't know what your attitude would be like if you were chained up to a Roman soldier and you were in prison. I like to think that I would be like Paul. That my tone would be, oh, I yearn for you with the affections of Christ as I'm chained here facing death. I don't know that I would be there yet in my sanctification. I hope to, I like to think so, but I don't know. But Paul is in chains. He's facing his impending death. 
and yet he's tapped into an eternal reservoir of joy that far surpasses his circumstances. And in this letter, we're going to find that this, this body of believers, the, the saints, and he notice in the opening, he, he says to the saints, all of you in the church of Philippi, even the overseers and the deacons, he's saying all of you, or no one's excluded from this, it's everyone. This is, I'm writing to all of you. And he, what he does is he's pulling, you know, you know, you've heard this line, right? We've all heard it said, you can't give away what you don't have. Have you, have you heard that said? Like, as a leader, you can't lead someone somewhere you've never been, right? Like, if you're, you know, you're discipling someone, it's hard to disciple someone into something or pour into someone something that you don't have. So what Paul does in this letter that we find is that he's using his own past experiences, and he's saying, listen, I, I know you guys are going through something, because this, this amazing body of believers, they were going through something. There were there was opposition they were facing. There was challenges they were facing. There was discouragement that they were facing. There was some disunity in leadership that they were facing. And so what Paul's doing as he talks about this joy and he highlights he's imprisoned, what he's kind of doing is saying, hey, listen, I've tapped into something and I'm pulling from my history in God and I'm trying to pull. It's not found in likes and shares and follows and read like your ultimate source of joy is not fame your ultimate source of joy is not that you're known by by other men no he's saying that your joy is has to be this deep seated reality that we are invited into called the person of Jesus Christ and Paul tapped into that joy so that when he was in chains, he could rejoice, not because of his chains, but because of the one in whom he was in chains for. He had tapped into true, eternal joy. He could rejoice in his chains. And he pulled on his personal history to call the Philippian church to rejoice in the midst of their opposition. He, his life, honestly, was a, a testimony of that incredible passage, that Psalm 16, I, I believe it's verse 11, that in your presence is fullness of joy. Not in my comfort is presence of joy. Not in my safety is the presence of joy. No, 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 no. Not in all of my resources and my massive bank account. It's not actually there. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The abiding presence of the Holy Spirit was the ultimate source of joy for Paul. It has to become your ultimate source of joy. The abiding presence of the Holy Spirit has to be the reservoir that you tap into. Because it's never ending. It's eternal. It's the ultimate source of joy. Peter writes in 1 Peter, he speaks to this and he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Here, listen to this verse, verse 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Can you imagine the spirit of glory that rested on Paul? Beaten, imprisoned, Stoned, reviled, hated, accused, in chains, facing death, spirit of glory, resting on him. We get frustrated when we order the number one at Chick-fil-A and we ask for no pickles and they put the pickles on there. Every time I ask, no pickles, they're there. We get frustrated, come on, how easy, easy we get frustrated 
We're driving down the road and someone accidentally cuts us off. They didn't see us. We just lay on the horn. Are you kidding me? Speed up, get on their tail. Right? We get, we're so easily agitated and frustrated. Peter says, hey, 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 hey. You're going through a trial. Don't be surprised. Hey, some of you in the room, recently you've made real decisions for Jesus in your life. Some of you have changed your lifestyles. You've stopped doing things you used to do. You used to go to these certain places. You used to hang out with this certain group. You used to partake in certain things. And you're, you're no, you've, the Lord started doing something in your life. It's like, I, I, mm, I, can't, I can't touch that anymore. You know, I'm not going to consume this anymore. I'm not going to watch this anymore. I'm not going to go to that place anymore. Some of you have been making those decisions in your life. And what you're finding now is that as you've made those decisions, people don't always understand. Can I get a witness in the room? That those you used to be so close with, your, your friends, it's usually the ones you're closest with, your family, your friends, your homies. You've been best friends since kindergarten, since the playground. You've always done everything together, but now... The Holy Spirit is doing something in your heart. He's changing you, and you're starting to make those different decisions, and all of a sudden, hell starts breaking out around you. Does anybody relate in the room? People start mocking you. Oh, you're a Christian now? Oh, you're, oh, you're holier than thou? Oh, you can't watch that? Oh, come on. Well, oh, you think you're better than all of us? Right? All these things get said. And what happens is the enemy loves to try to bring an open door of discouragement, bring confusion. But Peter's saying, hey, 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 listen. Don't be surprised at the fiery trial you're going through. When you're insulted, the spirit of glory is on you. And all of a sudden, you can change perspective. And when the mocking comes and the making fun of and the insults and the reviling, you can rejoice because it's a testimony that, oh, there must be a different spirit on me. So Paul is, he's trying to get the, this church, this Philippian church saying, listen, rejoice. Opposition's there, but you can have joy in the midst of your opposition. He goes on to say this famous verse in verse 6. We all know this verse. He says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I love it in the message. He says, there has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. Paul says, I am utterly convinced. I'm immovable on this. I don't care what you hurl at me. I don't care what you said. I don't care about your arguments. I don't care about how you feel. Your feelings mean nothing to me. I'm convinced he who began a work in you will finish it. What are you convinced of? Do you have something in your life that you can say without a doubt? Can you quote that verse over your life? Without a doubt, I am convinced that he who began a good work in me will bring it to completion. I believe tonight that the Lord wants to bring about a great convincing in our hearts. My prayer is that every single person in here watching on live stream, that you would be so convinced leaving. He's for me. He started it and he'll finish it. And that that would be your confidence, not in your ability to perform it, not in your ability to fulfill it but in his ability to do it on your behalf. Paul was speaking to this church and he was saying, listen, it's been God from the beginning. It's been God, you have a sovereign beginning. 
We went through the series in Acts, and in Acts chapter 16, we see the birth of this community of believers. We see what happened, how this church was born. And Paul is, he's reminding them, hey, God started and he initiated something in you. And I'm convinced he'll finish it. In Acts chapter 16, I'll, I'll read it, you have to turn there, verses 6 through 10, we see that Paul was trying to go to Asia, and it says that he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go. And so then he tries to go to a couple other places, and it says the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Man makes many plans, but the Lord directs his steps. Paul had all, they had all these things in mind. They're on their second missionary journey and they've got all these places they want to go and all of a sudden, closed door. Closed door. Forbidden. You can't go there. And then Paul has a vision of a man from Macedonia that says, come over here and help us. So Paul, convinced now, goes and preaches the gospel. Why did the Spirit redirect them? Well, if it said it was the spirit of Jesus would not allow him to speak. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. He will only send you where there's harvest. He looks for harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest. His eyes were on the harvest. He says, no, 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 Paul, not there. I know you want to go there, but that's I'm, I'm not right now. Okay, I'm going to go, no, 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 not right here. How quick are you and I to get discouraged when we have a closed door? We try to kick that thing down, break a window, do whatever we can. There's opposition, yeah, it's God. You see, the, the Lord wants to mature us. He wants us to become mature so that we can actually discern who, who's opposing me right now. Because there is opposition of the enemy. We're going to talk about that. But then there's opposition from God. And so the Spirit was redirecting Paul because he was saying, listen, I know it's not in your mind, but it's in my mind. Because where I want to send you, it's going to affect the entire globe. And we find that when, church, or when Paul goes and this church is planted in Philippi, it's the first time the seeds of the gospel go to Europe. And then from Europe to the ends of the earth. You see, the Holy Spirit thinks so different than you and I. And we have to learn to follow and discern his voice. The Spirit was looking for a businesswoman named Lydia. There was a slave girl that needed deliverance and there was a jailer who needed to be saved. And we read the story in Acts 16 where all of these people are born again and we see this sovereign beginning and Paul's reminding them, hey, it wasn't even my idea that I came to you. Remember, he who began the work, he started something. He will finish it. The gospel goes to Europe in Acts 16, 14, just to drive the point home. This is talking of Lydia, the businesswoman. It says that the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Lydia did not open her own heart. You did not open your own heart. The Lord opened her heart. Makes me think about John 15. You know the words from Jesus, his famous words where he says, hey, 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 you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you. What else did he say in the book of John? He said, no one can come to the Father unless what? The Father first draws him. He who began a good work in you. Not you who began a good work in him. He began the work in you. You are not the author of your breakthrough. Some of you in the room, you desperately need a breakthrough in your life. You need a financial breakthrough. You need a relational breakthrough. I heard some laughter. Be healed right now. <laughs> Be healed. 
You need a breakthrough in your career. You need a breakthrough in a community. You just need, you don't even know what it is. You just feel, you know, when you're in those moments, like, I just need a breakthrough. I don't know what it is. You're not the author of your breakthrough. He's the author of your breakthrough. Your job and my job is not to be the one that brings the breakthrough. Our job is to comply with the one who brings the breakthrough. Whatever he's doing, yield to that. Your greatest breakthrough will be when you surrender to what he's doing. The truth of the matter is that God has begun something in you. He has initiated something in your life. You're feeling it. You're seeing it. Those around you are seeing it. Something has occurred. You've stepped over a line. You have. You've crossed a line whether you know it or not. If, if, if I took a poll in this room and ever, if I made you look back at your life even six months ago to where you are now, some of you would be appalled at what you were doing six months ago. Yeah. So maybe a week ago. I don't know. But what I do know is that he began something. He initiated something. Philippians 2, uh, 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Did you know that your life bears his fingerprints? You are not your own creation. Your life bears the marks of his hands. That word workmanship, it means you're his masterpiece. When you look at yourself in the mirror, when you wake up in the morning, do you think, I am God's masterpiece. Probably not. It'd be kind of strange if you said it that way when you woke up. But I do believe that the Lord wants to convince you, because it's in the scriptures, that you are his masterpiece. And that maybe you should wake up some mornings and say it very strangely looking in the mirror. I am his masterpiece. And you should hold your chin up a little higher. And you should act like you're part of a royal family. Because you are. Is it your dad, the king? Your life bears his fingerprints. You're his masterpiece. You're formed and fashioned by the greatest artist. Genesis 1.1. Put yourself in the, sh in the shoes for a moment. You have no idea anything about God. You don't know anything about Jesus. You don't know that there's a father. You don't know that there's a son. You don't know that there's a Holy Spirit. You just... You don't know anything. Someone hands you a Bible and says, here, I want you to learn about God. So what would you do? You wouldn't go to the book of John like most people say, hey, I haven't started the book of John. They'll understand it. No, no, no. You would probably go to page one, would you not? When we get a book, we don't start in the middle. So you would open up and you would get to this. And here's the, I want to tell you the first things you would learn about God if you, if you had no idea and you opened the Bible. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Two things you would learn about God right off of the bat. Number one, he is the God of beginnings. He is the God of beginnings. And number two, he is the master creator and designer of the beginnings. If you had no idea about God and you read those verses, in the beginning was God. And he created the heavens and the earth. And then as you continued to read through the scriptures, and then you finally got to the New Testament, and you began to read in the book of John and in the epistles, and you find that all things were made by him and in him and through him, and all of a sudden you would realize, wait a minute, the God of beginnings who created the heavens and the earth says, I'm his masterpiece. I'm his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus, you would begin to view yourself a little different 
than maybe you do now. The one who began a work in you is the same one who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. You need to know that the grace of God is working in your soul. When you don't feel it, when you're unaware of it, He's shaping you, He's forming you, and He is the greatest artist there is. He is the artist of all artists. Think of the most creative person you know on the earth. They are dull. They have no skills compared to the one who paints the sunsets. They have no skills. The greatest songwriter you know cannot write a song like the one the Father sings and dances violently over you. There is no comparison to this God. The grace of God is working in your soul. I love how Spurgeon says it. He said, the work of grace is in the hands of one who never leaves his work unfinished. God doesn't leave his work unattended. And he doesn't leave it unfinished. Come on, he is the God of the cross. It is finished. He finishes what he starts. He finishes what he starts. What has he done in your life? Where do you feel delay? He'll finish it. Where are you feeling frustrated? He's still working. He doesn't unattend his work. He's working. You were fashioned and accomplished. You were fashioned to accomplish that which he predestined you to do. And he is at work in you to complete the very thing he started. How was Paul convinced of this? Because, right, like, how did he know? How, how could Paul say, there is no doubt in my mind, saints, that the one who began a good work, I'm convinced, you couldn't, you couldn't convince me otherwise, how was he so convinced? I would say two things. Number one, I think probably part of his own testimony. He's seen the work of God. He knows that God initiated his salvation, as we talked about in our series on Acts. When God knocked him off his horse, that was initiated by God. And he's seen that testimony. But John Piper brings out an incredible point. He says, you have to read down a little bit in those first few verses. And he says, for God is my witness how I yearn for you with the affection of Christ. And he brings this point out. He says, Paul had tapped into the love of Christ for people. And he said, if I feel this way about you, then I know I would keep you. How much more? How much more does he feel about you? If I would keep you, then I am convinced he will keep you. He will finish what he started. God will finish what he started in you. But there's another side to the coin. I want to read you a quote by Martin Lloyd-Jones. This is what he says. The Christian life in the first place is a warfare. It's a struggle. He goes on to say that there is no grosser or greater misrepresentation of the Christian message than that which depicts it as offering us a life of ease with no battle and no struggle at all. Now that doesn't mean every day's an intense battle. If every day for you is intense spiritual warfare, then I'm going to have Derek pray for you later and uh, we'll deal with that. But what it does mean is this is that you have an enemy who hates your guts. You have a real enemy who has real demons that absolutely hate you. They hate you. Like, you need to know that. They hate you. And do you know why they hate you? Because the one who they hate the most resides in your body. And he's making you look more like himself. And every day that you look more like him, the enemy gets more angry. He does. 
You've noticed it. We talked about it. You've been making changes. You've been looking more like Jesus. And all of a sudden, as you start looking more like him, your family starts falling apart. You lose your job. Whatever. You fill in the blank. Something happens. And you're like, wait a minute. I thought I'm making the right choices. Shouldn't my life get better? And he's like, well, I never promised you that all your circumstances were going to get better. But I, what I promised you is that I'd be with you. Oh, what I promise you is that if you get persecuted for my name's sake, oh, the spirit of glory will rest on you. You see, life is, is a warfare. It's a struggle. It's a battle. How many of you, just by a show of hands, in the last two weeks, you have felt some type, maybe you don't have a language for it, but you felt some type of resistance or warfare or something just like that you've been wrestling through, like a struggle. Like, man, just raise your hand high. I want you to look around the room. You're not alone. Don't be surprised at the fiery trial you're going through. You have an enemy who hates your guts. Now, does that encourage you? I don't, probably not. Shouldn't really encourage you. But when you start taking Jesus seriously, the enemy starts taking you seriously. So when the enemy starts taking you seriously, you should. Another sermon. But you see, right. they were doing something right. Paul was going through it. Was it. It wasn't because the enemy wasn't afraid of him. No, he was threatened by him. You know what's amazing? If you look at the end of Acts, Paul was under house arrest, but it says that the gospel knew no bounds. You can be in chains, but you can't stop the power of the gospel. I don't care what you're going through. The gospel's stronger. I don't care the limitations you feel. God's bigger. I don't care even how you view yourself. He sees you different. I do care how you view yourself. I want you to see yourself how he sees you. What I'm saying, the point is that he sees different. He has a different perspective about you. So what do we do with this? He who began a, a good work in you will complete it. But yet how many of you know, maybe you've had, maybe you've had one of those moments where someone's given you a prophetic word or you've, been, or you've been reading through the Bible, you're having your quiet time, you're, you're whatever, maybe you're at a church service, and like that verse, just, it just hits you. You know what I'm talking about? And you're just like, man, that, like, God is speaking to me. Anyone ever had that? Whether it's like a prophetic word or a verse, like just hits you like, man, that's, I just know God's speaking to me. And you kind of, you cherish that thing, right? Like I hope you do, right? Like if God's, like if God speaks to you, like you should probably cherish what he says. So what do we do then when, he says something, he's given us a promise, but yet we're living in between the promise and fulfillment. What do you, how do you then live when it's like over here I got the word about fill in the blank, over here is, is like the fulfillment, but I just feel like I'm right here in warfare zone. And I try to take a step closer to Jesus and it's like, man, grenades are flying at my head. I try to take another step to Jesus, and then, man, I'm just having the craziest dreams. I try to take another step towards Jesus, man, my friends are disowning me. I try to take another step towards Jesus, man, I lost my job. What are you, how do you live then when everything around you does not align with what he said? Can I get a witness if anyone has ever been in that place? Well, Paul gives us a way to fight in these seasons. Can I tell you what it is? 1 Timothy 1.18, he writes this to young Timothy, and here's what he says. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you wage the good warfare. He's saying, Timothy, we laid hands on you. We prophesied over you. God gave a promise to you. God has spoken to you. You're going through it. There's warfare. Let me tell you how to wage war in the midst of warfare. Don't scream at the devil. Declare promise. Declare promise. You're going through warfare? warfare? God, you said. Warfare gets heavier, God, you said. Families falling apart, as for me and my house. Bank accounts drying up, 
my God will supply every need according to the riches. You see, you wage war not by having a yelling match with a demon. How did Jesus wage war in the wilderness? It is written. It is written. I have a promise. I'm his beloved son. I have no need to engage in that second level warfare. I've heard from the highest of heavens. He's proud of me. He loves me. You wage war by promise. Ian, can I get a, I got some props tonight. Ian, can you bring me my props up here? We got, we got verses on the screen. We got props. What is happening? He who began a good work. Amen. Thank you, brother. Um, I remember, I've shared some of my story on, on these Monday nights. I remember when there was a, a moment, season of my life when I started making decisions for Jesus, like radical decisions. Like I was a drug addict and then I decided not to be a drug addict, right? Like that's a, that's a radical decision, um, right? Like, I, I, you know, like I'm living in full-blown rebellion and I decide like I don't want to live in rebellion anymore. So those are like big, you know, we've all had those. Hopefully, don't leave me alone in this. You're not all perfect. Um, but, right, we've all had those moments where we make these big decisions, you know, and I went to this program called Teen Challenge, and I needed to get away from where I was, and I went to this, you know, year-long Christian boot camp, literally, and, like, I didn't have a phone, I didn't have a computer, I didn't have anything. I could write letters, and I got a four-minute phone call once a week, and all I could do was really read the Bible, um, and I'm in this old school with a bunch of other drug addicts trying to get their life right, and so it was a very interesting, as you can imagine, environment there, and um, needless to say, but I remember, so I go, and I don't, really have a, I don't really have a clue what's going to happen. All I know is if I don't make a change, I don't know if you've ever been in this place, it's like if something doesn't change in my life, it's going to be bad. You know what I'm saying? You've all been there. It's like, I got to make, I got to change. I got to either, I got to cut this relationship off or I got, I got to get out of this community or I got to, I got to get away from this, whatever, this job or this killing me. I got, whatever it is, we've all had those moments. I knew I had to get away. I had to go do something. And I had tried everything else. And I was like, okay, it's Jesus, it's Jesus or nothing. Like, I don't, I don't know where else to go. So, like, I, he's it. Like, there's nowhere else for me to go. Um, and so I went. And, um, man, it was a challenge. Team challenge. Who would have thought it would have been challenging? And so I'm there. And I, I, I learned how to wage war while I was there. I learned how to wage war because... Like, I, like we said, when you start taking Jesus seriously, the enemy starts taking you seriously. And so uh, the, warfare, the warfare got heavy. The dreams were horrible. The memories were flooding in. I don't know if you've done that. Maybe you've been in a, you know, an unhealthy relationship and you get out of it. But, man, it's like everything you see, you drive by the restaurant that you used to go to and the memories just flood in. She used to order the lasagna. I love that lasagna. Maybe we should just go get lasagna and just make sure she's okay. No, you know, all that you're just thinking like, wait a minute, what? Like, I hate lasagna. I hated that. I don't even like Italian food. What's happening? So I remember the warfare, right? It just was like, because I, I, was, I was putting a stake in the ground. I was saying, you know, I didn't know it, but I was saying, hey, devil, you've had me for the last 20 plus years, but it's over. And so with every step I was taking towards Jesus, the enemy's grip was, reach was getting further and further away. And so the warfare got intense, and I learned how to wage war while I was there. And I want to show you how I waged war. Can I show you? You need a bucket. You need a, a little hand shovel. And you need an index card. And for four hours a day, for about, I don't know, three or four months maybe, we had, this, we had this area in the back. Anybody ever heard of something called the back 40? You ever heard that saying? The back 40 just means like a big piece of land that really is, has, is just kind of uncultivated land. It's just the back 40, you know. Um, so we had this big property behind us, and we called it the back 40. And it was where you kind of, it was kind of contemplation station. You just go walk around, just contemplate your life. Man, what am I doing here? I'm in Michigan, man. I miss Tennessee. Snow's here. It's cold. Oh, man. And so this big land, and uh, 
So for four hours, my work duty for the first three months I was there, we had work duties. And my work duties, I'd have to sit on this bucket. And um, I would, and there, it was probably, I don't know, the, the land, this one part was, you know, probably five, six acres. It's a pretty big piece of land. And um, it was full of dandelions. You know, little dandelion. They're like weeds. And um, I had to take this little shovel and this bucket, and I had to go pick dandelions for four hours. And that was my job. And I'd fill my bucket up, and I'd go dump it. And, I'd, and so for four hours, I'm back there, contemplation station, just wondering, what in the world am I doing with my life? Miserable, sick, detoxing, just having no earthly idea what is going on in my life. But then all I could do was read the Bible. And so what I saw other guys do is they would have these index cards, and they would have verses on them that they would memorize. And so for me, we had to kind of pick like, you know, I don't know if you ever had to have this or maybe uh, going to church growing up, but you kind of had to have a life verse. You guys know, like, if you, you ever hear people give their testimony, they, like, they had a life verse. Like, I got to get a life verse. What's my life verse? Anyone? No? Must, okay. Oh, it's okay. Thank you, Moda. <sighs> Not alone. So for me, I was like, I got to get a life verse. I don't even know one. What's, what's the verse? Russian roulette. No. So I opened the Bible, you know, and this verse stu- stu- stood out to me. And you know what the verse was? It was Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. And so what I would do is I'd have these, I'd have these little cards in my back pocket, and I'd pick, pick weeds, pick dandelions. And while I'm picking the weeds, I would sow seeds of gospel truth in my heart. You like that rhyme? Made that up. It's powerful. So creative. But I would be... I would be rehearsing truth because every day I wanted to kick the bucket. Like I wanted literally to kick this thing. Like I wanted to drop kick it. I remember one morning because on certain mornings all we had to eat was oatmeal. And there was no like, you know, oatmeal's good if you can put, if you can put the sugar in there. You can put the fruit in there. You got the brown sugar. You got the butter. You got the peanut butter in there, you know. I would just get plain oatmeal. And I remember one day sitting there. It was like it was, it was a warfare. It was a wrestle. I wanted to pick up this bowl of oatmeal and just chuck it against the wall. That was like my, that was how I was feeling every day. So I'm back there with this, with this bucket, just what is happening in my life. I'm going through the warfare, but then like I would want to quit so bad. I'd want to quit so bad. And then I would just remember, no, 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 no. He who began a good work in me, he'll bring it to pass. He'll finish what he starts. Something, something's starting in my life. And I remember three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, a month in, Two months in, you're feeling a little better, and then it's just like, then it's like I can't wait to pick dandelions because I'm getting filled with truth, and it's all of a sudden I'm waging war, and the enemy's like, hey, remember you were a drug addict, and then all of a sudden, like, 2 Corinthians 5 became my new life verse. Like, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away, and behold, all things are made new, and so I'm back there, and the enemy comes in, he's like, hey, you're never going to change, and I'm like, too late, dog. If any man be in Christ, he's brand new already. And so I just start speaking truth, and I learn that I'm not waging war by having a yelling match with a demon. I'm declaring and decreeing truth and promise over my life. And before I know it, I just, I'm walking with my head held a little higher. I'm having a little bit more faith on the inside. And you know what was, what's so interesting is that when you get in seasons of breakthrough the enemy will always have an easy out for you he will always have an easy out for you when I was there I had to give them a bus fare before I came so like they had to have money in like this little account of mine so that if I wanted to leave they could immediately put me on a bus I didn't have to call anybody I didn't have to tell anybody I had to walk in and say hey I want to go to the bus station so every day I knew I could walk in I could walk in and tell them, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Take me to the bus station. I want to leave. You see, the enemy always has an easy out for you to go back to that old thing. But God says you've got to declare promise. You see, we've got to become people who live from the future. You've got to learn to live from the future. If you don't have a promise, you won't know what you're living for. I'm not talking you got to have a dialed prophetic word from the most prophetic person on the planet. you got like so many pages here of Bible promises. Just pick one. Just find one. 
rehearse that thing. Wage war by promise. He who began a good work in me will complete it. He who called me is faithful. And day after day, I would wage war with promise. You see, you need a back 40 in your life. You need a place, you need a contemplation station where you can just go back there, where no one's around, and you can wage war, not by focusing on the enemy, but by decreeing and declaring promise. You need to, you need to learn to say it out loud. Do you know Proverbs 6, I think it's 2, talks about how you can become snared by your words. The Lord really challenged me recently, said, hey, you're holding yourself captive to negative emotions by negative speech. Your negative speech holds you captive. you got to start changing the way you talk. Your confession has to change. Your confession has to change. you got to get rid of the negative mental structures that you've built in your mind through negative speech and rehearsing your disappointments. you got to start rehearsing promise. you got to wage war with promise. you got to find some words in this book Hold them, treasure them, ponder them, and begin to declare them. And I promise you what you'll find is that you're getting closer and closer and closer and closer to your promise. And what happens is that as you train yourself in the scriptures, then you you begin to become attuned to his voice. And what happened for me is that um, I became attuned to his voice. And about, I don't know, maybe five months into the program, I was there for a at a church. And um, I'm sitting there in, I don't know, the second row, and there was this missionary that was speaking. And it was not very, um, it wasn't very inspiring. It was, you know, it was just, he was sharing some stories, and it was amazing. And um, he wasn't the best communicator. It was just kind of a normal night. And all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me. He says, I want you to always pray for missionaries. And there's going to be a moment when I tell you to go, and I want you to just go. And so what I did is I wrote that down in my Bible, in the front. I didn't tell anybody. I wrote it down in my Bible, and I wrote, go, just go, always remember to pray for missionaries. And so when things got hard, when things were challenging, when I wanted to quit, when it was eight months in, and I'm like, I'm good, I don't need to be here anymore, no, no, no. God is a God of completion. i got to finish it. He hasn't finished, so I'm not finished. And I was saying, I said, no, no, one day he's going to tell me, he's going to tell me to go. It's not going to be my decision. He's going to tell me. Because he said, I'm going to tell you to go. So I had, all of a sudden, I had a new promise. I had a new word that I could wage war with. And so I remember I graduated Teen Challenge, and I go and I live with my aunt and uncle in California, Central California, for a year. And all of a sudden, I'm working the night shift at Ralph's. Yeah, night shift. Anybody ever worked the night shift? Man, I'm praying some of you get thrown into night shift, man. That's going to be your back 40. It was for me, and I'm like, oh, what am I? Like, I mean, can you imagine? Like, I did, I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I moved all across the country to a place I'd never been, town of 15,000 people. I'm working night shift at a Ralph's grocery store stocking shelves, and I just, I just all of a sudden, I'm in it again. What are you doing with your life? He who began a good work in me. He'll complete it. And all of a sudden at night, I'm pushing my cart through the aisles. And you know what I did? I put a speaker on that thing. And I started listening to worship. And I started listening to sermons. And by the time my time ended at Rouse, we had worship playing on the loudspeaker. And people would get healed as we would pray. And I remember this one girl who was really going through a tough time. I remember the last day of work, she walks up to me. She says, is Jesus really as good as you say he is? And I said, oh, he's even better. Do you see, God had a plan for me while I was there, and I just continued to rehearse promise as I'm stocking shelves and putting the dog food and the cat food on the shelves, and I'm so tired, why am I doing this? No, 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 he started something. i got to wage the good warfare. i gotta, I got to live in the future. This, this is just a temporary stop on my way to my promise. i got to keep waging the good warfare. Then I go to this conference across the country in Chicago, and I'm there, and we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, a guy gets up on stage, and he gives an announcement, and he says this, Jesus said, go. And all of, a, all of a sudden, I felt a weight of presence on me, and I remembered, I'm going to tell you to go. Just go. You see, tonight, I brought that Bible from, I don't know, 
however long ago, 2010, and in here you probably can't see it. Always remember to pray for missionary workers. Go, just go. Listen, I'm, I'm here to tell you tonight that you've got to rehearse your promises. Some of you are in this in-between stage in your life and you're unsure how you're going to get there. I'm telling you it's time to look up. Your disappointment has caused you to walk with your head down long enough. He's the glory and the lifter of your head. It's time for you to look up. It's time for you to rise above the warfare and to fight the good warfare. Rehearse your promises. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 says this. If you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Come on, saints, look up. Look up tonight. There's a great convincing that the Lord wants to bring in your heart, and he wants your eyes to look up. Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 through 17, the Lord said this to Abram. After Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes. Look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that If one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Verse 17, arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. It's time for you to explore your promised land. It's time for you to become a person of the future. That may you, though you may not be in it right now physically, In the place of prayer, you can begin to declare and rehearse the promises in such a way that you'll feel like you're there and you'll start living according to that promise instead of according to your disappointment. Then it won't matter if you're in chains, if you feel restricted, if you're you're being persecuted, if you're being reviled, if you're being insulted or made fun of. You can stand there with full resolve and you can say, I am confident of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Stand with me as I read some of these verses over you. I believe tonight something's going to break off your life. I do. I believe disappointment's going to lift off. I believe some of you are going to be physically healed in your neck because disappointment has caused you literally to look down. And tonight, the glory and the lifter of your head is going to raise your chin up and your neck's going to be healed. It's going to happen. I want to read some verses over you. I want you to receive this. My charge to you, the Lord's charge to you is look up. Look up. Psalm 3, 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me. You're the glory and the one who lifts my head. Psalm 1, 10, 7. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside, therefore he shall lift up the head. Psalm 91, verse 14, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Psalm 145, verse 14, the Lord upholds all who fall and he raises up all who are bowed down. Psalm 146, verse 8, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Psalm 147, 6, the Lord lifts up the humble. Habakkuk 3, 19, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. Proverbs 24, 16, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. You, some of you need to hear that. You felt like your whole life you've just been falling and falling and falling and falling. And the Lord says, it's time to rise again. Though you fall seven times, it's time to rise again. Micah 7, verse 8, do not rejoice over me 
my enemy. For when I fall, I will arise. Say, I will arise. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. You, you got to begin to explore and live in your promised land. You got to live like you're there. You got to start fighting the good fight of faith and waging war with the promises of God over your life. And I believe some of you in the room, you don't feel like you have any. Maybe you don't have the prophetic word. You don't have the go, just go moment, but it's coming. And until that comes, I want to give you some promises that you can cling to. If we can get some of those on the screen, the next slide. I want to give you some promises, some scriptures that you can make your own, that you can begin to rehearse. Romans 8, 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, hell might be breaking out around you, but God works all things together for your good. You can hold that and take it to the bank. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Romans 8, 38 and 39, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Some of you feel so separated from God. Oh, I'm here to tell you, friend, nothing can separate you from him. Though you feel it, it's not true. Though you feel it, it's not true. Nothing can separate you. It's time you separate yourself from the lie. Abram had to separate himself from Lot, and then the Lord said, lift up your eyes, go. Walk through your promised land. You gotta cut the lies off from your life and begin to take the word. You gotta begin to wage the good warfare. Nothing, nothing, say nothing. nothing. Come on, say nothing. <laughs> nothing can keep you from his love. Nothing can, nothing can. Nothing, say nothing again, say nothing. Nothing, nothing. there's nothing in the world. No angel, no demon, no principality, no sickness, no suffering. Nothing can keep you from it. It can't, it's not possible. Nothing can keep you from his love. You can walk out of this place tonight confident, confident, zero doubt in your mind, he loves me. He loves me. Can we keep going? Matthew 28, 20, oh, this should be written on your heart. I am with you always to the end of the age. Some of you feel like he's left you behind. No, no, he doesn't leave his work unattended. The promise for you is that he's always with you, even to the end of the age. And guess what the most amazing part is? Paul, when he said, he who began a good work in you will complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. John said it this way, when you see him, you will become like him. Just as surely as he came one time, he's coming again. Just as surely as he came once, he will return again for a pure and spotless and holy bride. And on that day, you will become face to face with him and every trial, every ounce of suffering, every tear, all of that stuff will fully make sense and you will be like him. Come on, that's your great hope, friend. Ephesians 3.20, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make straight your paths. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear. He didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you a spirit of power, love, and self-control. Today, tonight, it's time. Separate yourself from fear. It's not from him. Your father did not give you a spirit of fear. Can we go to the next slide? Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not. Everybody say, fear not. Fear not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. 
His mercies never end. They never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is His faithfulness towards you. His mercy has not run out over your life. You can't sin your way out of His mercy. Are you kidding me? It's not possible. When you wake up tomorrow, your sin gets drowned in His mercy. You can't sin your way out of it. Fresh mercy for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. We've read Philippians 1, 6, Philippians 4, 19, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you, he knows your needs, he sees your needs, he will provide for your needs. When you get fear about your provision, pull this verse out of your back pocket. My God will supply my every need according to the riches in Christ. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Blessed shall be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundance. Psalm 103, bless the Lord. Forget not all his, his benefits. He forgives your iniquity. He heals your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. He satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You can hold fast to these promises. It's time for you to look up. It's time for you to lift your head. I don't want to stop until you believe it tonight. I don't want to go into worship until you believe it. I need you to believe it. He needs you to believe it. The world needs you to believe it. The world needs you to believe it. I believe, I feel the Lord is grieved in his heart when we beat ourselves down with negative speech. Some of you are so hard on yourself. Some of you, you beat yourself down talk down to yourself I just believe that tonight the Lord is saying enough 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 enough. stop with the nonsense I started something in you I love you you're my masterpiece act like it talk like it think like it got two prayers we want to pray tonight out loud together then we're going to go into worship we're going to have the ministry team lined up on the sides too not down in the front the ministry team you can be on the sides can we get the first uh, prayer up on the screen I want us to pray this out together here's what I want us to do I want us to pray this and to declare this out with confidence with faith Can you do that with me? I'm going to count to three and then we're going to go for it. You ready? One, two, three. Lord, grant me the spiritual understanding of how I can resist the devil. I have faith and I stand against the enemy through the power of Jesus' name. God is my shield and my refuge, a very present help in time of trouble. When the enemy comes against my soul, the Holy Spirit will raise a standard against him. Hang on. I need you to exert your voice. I need you to exert your voice. I need you to dig deep in and get that preacher's voice deep inside of you. You ready? One, we're going up to the second paragraph. One, two, three. The Lord will be my strength and I shall not be moved. I shall stand my ground in the day of battle. When my soul is attacked by a series of unusual bad experiences, irritations, and small calamities, I will resist the devil's lies by standing with my spiritual armor. I shall not be moved, for greater is he who is in me 
than he that is in the world. Can't see that part. Uh, up there, up there. I pray the word of God. I submit to you, O oh Lord. I resist the devil and I will f I draw near to you, Lord, with a pure heart and faith in your power. Come on. You got to learn to pray prayers like these. Can we get the last prayer? You guys ready? You got your preacher voice in? Okay, I, okay I'm going to do something. I know you're not going to want to do it, but I'm going to make you do it. If you're, if you're able. You don't have to, but I would love if we could pile the front and just go bananas on this prayer. If you are, if you, you can stay in your chair if you want, but if you feel the courage and the boldness to just come forward and let's rumble this prayer out loud and then we're going to go into worship together. I'll wait a minute if you want to come. You're more than welcome to stay where you are, but if you feel to come down, we want to pray this prayer together. And then we're going to go into worship. You guys ready? There's some people still coming down. Let's go. Get down here. I believe, come on, I believe tonight something's breaking off our lives. Something's breaking off your life. Come on, God, there's something he's bringing a convincing in you tonight. All right, you guys ready? One, two, three. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray with great faith that the new doors you have for my life will open. I will break through to new life opportunities and new anointing by the power of the Holy Spirit. I will remove all long-standing obstacles through faith, prayer, and fasting. By faith, I stretch toward the new challenges you have set before me. I will not draw back. I will not lose heart. By faith, I will destroy any obstacle that hinders progress and I will advance beyond all previous limitations. I will not quit, give in, or give up. I will not retreat, back off, or stand down. I will not shift into neutral, take a break, or do nothing. But by God's grace, I will break through and move ahead with supernatural strength. Come on. Come on. Band, you can come on up. Here's what I want to do. Listen, I want to tell you how doors open. Can I tell you how doors open? Remember how I told you how the church of Philippi started? Acts 16, do you remember? There was a Lydia, she got, she got saved. There was a slave girl who got delivered, set free. And then there was this moment when Paul and Silas were in prison. And they begin to praise in prison and doors opened. Oh, you didn't catch it. You didn't catch it. They're in prison. They're in prison, but they have a promise. It doesn't end there. And do you know what opened the door? Praise. Okay, a couple of us. Praise opened the door. Praise opened the door. Praise removes the shackle. Praise overrides disappointment because you stop focusing on what you don't have and you focus on Him. And so I believe as we go into worship, as we begin to praise, as we begin to lift our voice, something is going to break. But you, no, something will break. It has to, it has to break, it has to break. I'm not promising you that you're going to step into your promised land tomorrow, but here's what I'm promising you. He who began a good work in you, oh, he will bring it to completion. That is your promise. That is your promise. So tonight we're going to praise. We're going to worship. We're going to look up. Come on. He's the glory and lifter of your head. I lift my eyes up to the hills from where my help comes from. Father, tonight we lift our eyes. 
We lift our eyes. We refuse to let disappointment cause us to look down at the ground any longer. I pray that as we look up, as we worship, healing power would flow throughout the room. Those with neck pain and real issues in the neck would be healed. I pray that chains would break off of us tonight as we worship, as we praise, as we lift our eyes to Jesus. Tell him, just say, I lift my eyes to you, Jesus. Tell him that you're looking at him. Tell him you're lifting your eyes. You're lifting your eyes. We lift our eyes to you tonight, Jesus. We lift our eyes. We get our eyes off our circumstances and we begin tonight to fight the good warfare. We begin to declare and wage war with promise. Oh, that you who have called us, you are faithful. Surely you will do it. Surely you will do it. Surely you will do it. Come on, I want you to continue to lift your voice for a moment. I want you to begin to lift up praise to Jesus. Worship to Him. Lift up your eyes. Lift your voice. Tell Him He's amazing. Tell Him He's wonderful. Tell Him there's none like Him. Tell Him He's faithful. Tell Him He's kind. Thank Him for His new mercy. Thank you that He's going to do it on your behalf. Thank Him that He's working in you. Thank you. Thank Him that it's His power in you. Oh, we lift you up, O oh, King of glory. We lift you up and we worship. Come on, let's go for it.
Nothing can keep me from the blood of Jesus. Nothing can keep me from the blood of Jesus. It's by the blood that you redeemed us. Nothing can keep me from the blood of Jesus. Nothing can keep me from the blood of Jesus. Nothing can keep me from the love of Jesus. Nothing can keep me from the love of Jesus. Nothing can keep me from the love of Jesus. Oh, come on, let's declare this out together. Nothing can keep me. Nothing can keep me from the love of Jesus. Nothing can keep me from the love of Jesus. Nothing can keep me from the love of Jesus. Cause I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Nothing can keep me from the love of Jesus. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Oh, nothing can keep me from the love of Jesus.
yourself a stack of index cards and you would begin to write your promises on there and you would keep them by your bedside and you would put them in your Bible and you would put them in your car and you would tape them to your bathroom mirror and that everywhere you go it would cause you put them up a little higher because it makes you look up don't put it low put it high where you have to look up and you begin to rehearse and declare the promises of God over your life and you begin to rehearse scripture and declare scripture over your life over your family over your community over your friends over your job come on the title of my message tonight is won't he do it come on won't he do it don't you need a breakthrough won't he do it he will do it because he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of jesus christ we're going to end tonight but here's last encouragement we have some of our i think we have some of our staff and our prayer team if you're on the prayer team tonight, can you raise your hand just high if you're around? Raise your hand high. Here's what I want you to do. If you guys are on the prayer team, if you can kind of go maybe line up in front of the garage doors. As we end tonight, if you're in the room and you and you feel like you're in a real place of despair, where you're in a real, you need a breakthrough in your life. You need a word. You need a promise. You need something to hold on to. I want to encourage you to get prayer from our team. I'm not going to promise you they're, they're going to give you a life changing prophetic word though they might but I believe that the Lord will speak to you where two or three are gathered in my name there I am that as you go in agreement in prayer I believe the Lord wants to speak to you whether it's a verse whether it's a prophetic word whether it's a word of encouragement I just believe the Lord is ready and willing to speak so our team is lined up over there if you need a fresh word of encouragement something to hold on to find them on your way out I want to pray for you father we thank you for what you're doing on these Monday nights. We thank you for what you're doing in California and in the earth, Lord. We are so grateful that you are the God of breakthrough, that you are the God of new beginnings, that you are the ultimate creator, and that you are the author and the finisher of our faith, and that faithful are you who called us, and faithful are you who made the promise. And so, Lord, tonight, we draw a line in the sand, and we step across the line, and we declare that we will live according to promise. We will be those that live from the future. We will explore our promised land in the place of prayer and scripture. We will rehearse and wage the good warfare through promise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Be blessed tonight. 
We're going to be back next week. We're going to continue going through the book of Philippians. I believe that the the Lord is going to speak to us every week through this book, through this letter. So come hungry, come encouraged, have an amazing week, and we'll see you next week.